You're listening to the Modern Healthcare Back Office, a podcast dedicated to solving the billing issues and gridlock facing the healthcare industry, presented by ProChamp, hosted by Chuck Ellis and Rachel Schools. Hey there, folks. Chuck here, and thank you for joining us for the Modern Healthcare Back Office show. I am joined, as I often am, almost always am, by my co-host, Ms. Rachel Schools. How are you? Hey, what's up? And later in the program, we will be talking with Joey Graham, the Chief Revenue Officer here at ProChant. And before we get started with that, though, Rachel, I know this is a subject that has been very close to your heart for a long time. We're going to be talking about AI and RPA, or Robotic Process Automation, when it comes to healthcare revenue cycle management. When we broached this topic, what were some of the things that first came to mind for you? The robots are coming. The robots are coming. The robots are really coming, and it is the most exciting thing ever. Yeah. I love the Jetsons. Yeah. Oh, you know, I yeah. thought by now we would have... Push a button and it's done. I thought we would have had uh, flying cars and actual robot staff taking care of the house and stuff, and we're not there yet. But I think yeah. we're getting closer. I was thinking... Old man healthcare had some data, AI, AI, O. <laughs> that's a good one. That's where your mind goes when you have a four-year-old. Yeah, that's but a good one. Yeah, so I'm really excited about this because we're going to be talking a bit about this because the for the healthcare industry, it's really no secret that a lot of the back office processes are a little behind the times. My background is from marketing automation companies. I've worked for several of them, so I've gotten to to sit on the sidelines and watch the the bleeding edge of this stuff, and it's really exciting to see this come on to the healthcare field. Yeah. But before we get too much farther into this, I want to introduce everyone to Joey Graham. He's our Chief Revenue Officer here at ProChant. He has over 20 years experience in HME, DME, pharmacy infusion, billing management, back office processes. He's really seen this industry evolve as well as you, Rachel, you've got a lot of years experience in the industry as well. So Joey, thank you for coming on today and talking with us about this new process. Hey, thanks so much. I'm really excited to be here. All right. I think we might need to level set here a little bit because there are some folks that are, are just coming on and may not be familiar with the jargon or know the difference between what AI and RPA is. So Joey, let's just kind of, let's take us to AI 101. Let's go through some of the common acronyms and the definitions of what these things mean. Absolutely. Yeah. So actually I, I want to take even a step back from that and let's talk about the umbrella term automation, right? So automation is like a really hot topic right now. There's obviously nothing new, um, in terms of the concept, this is something that's been brewing for years and years now, but finally automation is really starting to get a hold and, um, when you look at the umbrella term automation for the purposes of our conversation today, and as we think about the healthcare providers that we work with in their world and what's relevant to them, let's say automation, the umbrella term breaks down into three different areas. So the first one is scripted automation. That's going to be where it's programmed directly into the software. That's what we're used to. We think of when you got your EMRs, you've got your billing system, they introduce features like auto posting. Uh, they introduce features like automatic eligibility and checks. Things like that stuff is somewhat scripted into the software. So Joey, um, would that be yeah. like when I'm setting up a flow or something on the yeah. sales side, is that scripted automation? It is. Yeah. So that's right. you can create flows, that's scripted automation. There's so many examples of scripted automation in our world. That's, that's what software does for us. Generally, the reason we get software uh -huh. is because it has the scripted automation in it and it does things for us. The second. Uh, under that umbrella automation, you've got scripted. The other one, the other two are the two that Chuck just mentioned, RPA and AI. So let's talk about them. RPA stands for robotic process automation. Sometimes these are also called bots. Bots are prevalent nowadays. They've been around for probably 20 plus years now, but uh, they're really, again, starting to get uh, more of a foothold. Um, bots will essentially take over a computer and perform repetitive actions over and over again. Bots are perfect for uh, processes that are very regimented, right? You take the same steps every time and you can generally use a bot to take over that process. And when we hear about automation nowadays, a lot of times that's what's being referred to is robotic process automation and just taking manual repetitive steps and automating those manual repetitive steps. My first exposure to this kind of automation really sticks out in my mind and it was I was 
traveling as a consultant for Braintree and I went to a client and I was talking to their, one of their operations guys, and I could see a computer in the corner of the room and nobody's sitting at it. And that computer is flying along doing all these steps, like opening up websites and copying things and pasting. And, and I was like, what is that? Well, they come to find out they had gotten sort of an out of the box RPA software and programmed it. It was not codified. You don't have to code the programming. You can literally point and click and you train the bot, the steps you want it literally. You, and then wait three seconds. Now click here, look for this image, click on it, go to this Excel sheet, copy this cell, paste it in this field. It's just, you go step by step by step. So. That was my first exposure to Joey, except what happened was I was doing some work for a client and I kept doing, so basically imagine it, I have a list of a spreadsheet full of these invoice numbers and I need to do the same thing on 5,000 invoice numbers and our development team, they did, or our team didn't have time to help me. So I went and found a tool just like that on my own and played with it. That was my first exposure to, yeah. and I was like. Siri, because I'm lazy. I was like, I am not going to do this 5,000 times. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, yeah. That same thing. It's so not like even that hard. We should wear, let's say I have a spreadsheet and it has, I don't know, hundreds of items on it or names or claim numbers, order numbers, whatever. And I need to go in and do something to each one of those, um, some action. Like I need to update the field to this, like then I can actually program a bot to do that. And it'll go right down that spreadsheet and, and, and work it for me. Yep. And that's where this all kind of started was like this company would hand the bot a sheet and then come back a couple hours later and it was done. Now it will get caught. It'll get caught up. It'll, you know, a lot. For instance, yeah. yeah, there will be things that happen. Websites will change. Something moves just a little bit. The bot can't find it anymore. Um, You'll have lags, internet lags and things where a screen doesn't load fast enough. And then the bot doesn't wait long enough to take the next auction and, and then it gets stuck. So RPA bots have to be monitored and managed. That's one thing I want to make clear is, um, uh, they're awesome, but they're dumb worker bees. That's essentially exactly. what these RPA bots, they're dumb worker bees. They do exactly what you tell them to do no more, no less. And when something varies, they get stuck and yep. you've got to go help them get on. So that's RPA. And then the third, under that umbrella of automation, I mentioned scripted, I mentioned RPA, and that third one is AI. And the AI is the, the futuristic Ooh. one. Yeah, yeah, that's the one that we're all really excited about. Scripted and RPA has been around for a long time. AI has been around for a decent amount of time, but it's really only been in the hands of a few, well, with big dollars, big bucks. This is big budget um, stuff, and it's complex to say the least. So within AI or artificial intelligence, there are many branches. We've all heard of, of different things like IBM has Watson, right? With their supercomputer. We've seen movies, right? The movie AI, the movies where the AI becomes self-aware, right? <laughs> all that stuff. Never goes well. There's a lot. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when you go down that path, you, you can very easily venture into science fiction. However, we all, we know that science fiction often becomes science fact because we dream of the future and then we invent that future. And so, I am a sci-fi futuristic dystopia addict, Joey, from the very early age of a 10 or <laughs> That's awesome. That's one of my things too. When I love sci-fi, I, I read sci-fi and uh, I'm, I'm a dork like that. Yeah, it's cool. It's really exciting. And But for our purposes, AI really breaks down into two main areas. You've got uh, machine learning or ML. Many of us have heard of machine learning. And the other one is called natural language processing, NLP, natural language processing. So we'll talk about what those are. So machine learning is when the machine is learning. The machine is automatically improving and it's generally about making decisions, making the right decisions. So machine learning is taking data, using an advanced algorithm to render decisions and predictions. It's, it's interpreting data. And then it's comparing its forecast or it's predicted to the actual, and it's getting better. It's understanding the difference and it's learning. That's the learning part. And then the next time it goes to make that decision, 
it's learned from that last one and it's a little bit smarter. And it's learning yeah. from the data, right? That's a great point, Rachel. When we think about rule sets, providers, you sit there, think about the rule sets when you set up your billing system, like when you set up um, the rules for when you're going to allow a claim to drop. Is this it procedure require... code requires this modifier yeah. in order to be paid exactly. and this combination you, of diagnoses code. You had to hard code that. You had to script that into your software, right? You did because you had to set up your products properly. You had to create your price tables. You had to tie them to the right payers. You had to have the right pr uh, modifiers on there. You had to have the right uh, prior auth flag, CMN flag. You spent you most of your time setting that up. That's right. Now in the future, machines will write their own rule sets. So imagine you didn't have to do any of that. And, and when you first started billing claims, it was, a, you got denied so much. It was just a giant mess. Then the system learns and fast forward a few months, all of a sudden the system is humming along and nothing's getting through that shouldn't. And because the machine has taken all this feedback and learned and written its own rules and then iterated on those rules. It does things I've tried to do with spreadsheets and <clears throat> plugging in algorithms and finding relationships. It does all of that just by itself. So which deep learning is a term that's thrown around a lot right now, um, including by us <laughs> and exciting, but finding real use cases of machine learning in the market is, is difficult. I know we're going to talk about that a little later. There are some things underway, but it's not as prevalent as things like RPA and obviously the scripted automation. I see it being able to do things like maintain price tables yeah, or make corrections, make cor So when we're billing, Joey, think about it. We might get 50 claims in a row where we need to go update something. Posting is the easiest example. So your cash poster is the one that sees all of your mistakes first. So how are we making sure that not only are we notifying the person that's handling collecting if a claim is not denied, but how are we notifying people, for example, that price tables need to be adjusted so we don't have to keep taking 10 extra keystrokes when we're posting? Right. I think it would, I see it being very helpful with stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so under that AI, that artificial intelligence term, which again, that's under the automation umbrella. The other one outside of and machine la learning that's relevant to our world right now is called natural language processing or NLP. So natural language processing is, is something we've all actually become more and more familiar with. And that's because many of us have one sitting in our pockets. You've heard of Siri, <laughs> you've heard of Cortana, you've heard of Alexa. I know I probably just set off everybody's devices. But um, <laughs> that's natural language processing in one way to really think about it. This is your ability to talk to a computer. It can hear you speaking um, as you naturally speak. Oh, and in fact, those sort of systems leverage machine learning to learn your accent and get better at understanding you. So somewhat of an, an example of both. But, but natural language processing is definitely something that's been around for a little bit. It's getting better and better, smarter and better able to understand, able to do a spoken as well as written language. So yeah, again, think of your, your device, but also think of things like doctors being able to dictate and having the system write out their notes for them. And even you leverage a system like machine learning to, um, codify what happened, codify that visit coded. Like there's actual literally AI based coding systems in place that leverage both of these technologies. In our industries, natural language processing is being used in a few different areas. One that sticks out in my mind is patient collections. There are systems now that will call your patients and attempt to collect money from them. And it's a fully automated agent. There's no person there. Um, and it's able to talk to them, get their credit card number and, and or put them on a payment plan even. So. Ooh. Could yeah, it talk pretty... to our doctors and ask for medical records? <laughs> you mean, how likely are they to talk to a machine, right? Yeah. What but if hey, they didn't know we, it was? We, maybe their systems will. I mean, that's the thing. In the future, I think our systems will talk to each other. Yeah. We won't have to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was wondering what's next after that. Can we just think <laughs> something and it happens? I don't know if either of you have used this or not. This is just something that I've discovered recently with booking a haircut. If you go on Google and you... Google places like salons near me, you can 
click a thing that says schedule an appointment and it'll have an AI assistant actually call the person at your local salon and schedule your appointment. You tell the machine when you want it done and it will interact with them and understand what they're saying. And if they come back with an alternate time, they'll say, we need a, a haircut on these days between this and this. And they'll say, how about Tuesday at four? And then it'll say, okay, that works within the parameters. And then it'll come back to me and give me a calendar invite. That's like, you have a hair appointment at Tuesday at four. It's just incredible. And usually the people that are interacting with this AI don't even know that they're talking to an AI because it's so good at understanding and responding in a natural sounding way that it sounds like just somebody talking and booking a hair appointment. Yeah. Yep. I could yeah. very easily see that happening with this type of thing where somebody doesn't even realize they're talking to a bot as they're asking for information over the phone or, or with a, a email chain. Absolutely. I've seen natural language processing in action in, uh, we all have meetings, right? We all have to work and, and we're, we're working on, tactical things like billing, but we all have meetings. We have these AI, what do we call them, Joey? AI meeting assistants? Yeah, like they're automated assistants. Yeah, and, AI assistants. Yeah. And it's a combination of AI and natural language processing where nobody should have anybody taking or distributing notes on calls anymore. Everybody should be fully engaged in every conversation and every meeting because this technology is out there fairly inexpensively that will handle all of that stuff for you, including storing away recordings and summarizing notes and handling follow-ups. It's actually wild, but it really is. I'm excited. I, I know that in the not too distant future, I will have an AI assistant that helps me. <laughs> so I yes. don't have to take so many notes and it does keep up with my calendar and it does keep up with my to-do list. That truly is coming. So it's exciting stuff. It is. We, Joey, we've been in this industry for a long time and I don't know about you, but I haven't really seen much change. It's been the same old stuff. So this is very exciting for me. It's, it's interesting. So if you look at something like Uber and Uber obviously has transformed and tr totally disrupted the taxi industry. And what's interesting, and maybe many people don't know this is that disruption happened over the course of about five years. And that was in, I guess, the late 2010s, early or mid, mid, it was what is like 2012 to 2017, something like yeah. that. Yeah. It was mid, mid, uh, 2010s. And up to that point, the taxi industry had been in place for a hundred years. And mm -hmm. in that hundred years, it had been just the same exact. And then all of a sudden over this five year period, it gets completely disrupted. Now, obviously taxi companies still exist, but that industry right. is changed forever. And to what Rachel just said, there's these things that are brewing and I don't know that it'll happen over a five year period, but we will start to see, I think some rapid changes in the way that our systems work and the way that our workflows work as this automation truly becomes more and more useful. And as it gets within reach for providers and businesses that don't have giant budgets, you know, right, right now this is. This stuff is in play for sure, but it's at huge companies with big budgets, big teams. The, the level of automation is incredible, but for a small business, medium-sized business, it's very much out of reach right now. But yeah. everybody can be upskilling. So I, I know, Joey, that a lot of people might hear this as billers and there's going to be some anxiety, right? Because these are major changes, but... You said it earlier, these bots, they don't work by themselves. So what's changing is like all of our knowledge is going to be the same, but our process might be a little bit different. So where our day today is spent mostly confirming sales orders and reading documents, we become supervisors of the bot, right? The work is still there, but the type of work that you're doing changes. That's right. I envision in the future, there will be call centers full of people whose job is to get through those CAPTCHAs. <laughs> yeah, you know where it's Still find the, the stop the light, yeah, or, or, or click the motorcycle. Click the, yeah, click on the motorcycle. There are going to be so many jobs that we don't think of today, right? Like because we couldn't we what that job is, but it, yeah. along the same lines, Joey, there's going to be jobs where people are just verifying email addresses, verifying phone, like very like yeah. similar to what we're doing now, but it's just it's going to change. That's right. Yeah. I think it's, it's interesting. Malcolm Gladwell pointed out in, I think it was what the dog saw or one of his books that there 
if you look back at an industry like refrigeration, there were three big stages in the last 150 years or so of refrigeration. And the first was ice storage, where people would, you know, collect the ice and store it in sawdust and keep it in cool buildings. And so they would try to make this ice last as long as they could. And then the second phase was ice boxes, people who were able to get ice and put it in boxes in their homes that were like giant coolers. And then the final one was powered refrigeration for all. And if you look at the industry leaders in all three of those industries, not a single one of them survived to the next jump. Wow. And I think that's going to be how it is for AI. Basically, this is such a disruptor, like you said, with Uber and while taxi cabs still exist, I don't even think about calling a taxi cab anymore because I've got an app on my phone that will get me someone immediately and be more affordable and I'll have better accountability for who's picking me up and paper trails and all that sort of thing as opposed to like a printed receipt that I'm going to lose in my pocket or whatever. And, you know, like the, like Rachel said, the robots are coming. And while there are a lot of concerns and security issues and some stuff that I'm sure we're going to be talking about more in a few minutes, like the people need to realize if you're not jumping on this now, by the time you realize, oh, I should have jumped on that. It, it could be a little too late for you. I also want to make sure, like a lot of things, like Joey said, are definitely out of reach, right? Because it requires big data and big money behind it. But there are definitely a lot of things that are in reach. And it is pretty simple to roll out. Robotic process automation, for example, would be a great way to combat some of these sort of labor shorts. So yeah, those are super simple. That's right. And when you take that one more big step back and talk about automation, the goals of automation. So the goals of automation are to speed up common tasks, to improve process throughput so that we're able to get through tasks quickly, more quickly. We're able to process more work. It's to reduce mistakes and error because humans are prone to error, right? We get distracted. We get some other name in our head. Sometimes we get a little dyslexic. Those kind of things, machines don't generally do that. Safety, obviously like automotive, we've all seen those bots, right? And that's another form of automation. Obviously these giant bots and these fully automated assembly lines, very much different from the days of Henry Ford. And finally it frees up humans so they can focus on higher value work. Um, and so that's what I think what Rachel was speaking of that really the, so Back in what the early 1900s, nobody could have imagined that there would be a whole career field called, you know, programming and, and mm -hmm. computer science, especially not that if you had gone into that in like the seventies and the eighties, then you'd be making buku bucks now. And that was a hundred percent the right move back then. They couldn't even imagine that. And I think we're in a similar situation now where we're worried because it rightfully so many jobs will go away or change dramatically as this automation rolls out. But on the other side, to Rachel's point, there will be new jobs that open up that we can't even imagine now. Things like mm -hmm. supervising armies of bots, that's, that will end up happening. So let's be open to it. And, but also let's think through these goals of automation, speeding up tasks, reducing mistakes. That's the name of the game here. And I'd say all that to say, this is a very much a generic term and you can, you can approach it many different ways in your own business and you can definitely start small. There are packages and platforms available to, for instance, in the RPA side of the things that are not that expensive. The one that I saw, remember I, my story, I, so the bot at that time, when I went out to that provider, the computer sitting in the corner, it's just going nuts. That computer's job was to go out and pull tracking numbers from their shipping vendor run those tracking numbers through the UPS or the FedEx website, print the proof of delivery, upload the proof of delivery into Brighttree documents. That that's what that bot did. And I was like, wow. Yeah. So, but think, I mean, that something I bet a lot of us do. And if we don't, then we should, we need to get that proof of delivery guys. But that that's how that was. But the program they used was a program called win automation and Win automation, it's been around for 20 years now. Um, at that time, it was about a hundred bucks. I think if you go search it right now, it's not, it, it's 250 or something. It's a little bit more inflation, but that's not that much, right? You could literally go out and spend a couple hundred bucks to buy one of these bots to take over a computer for you and do repetitive tasks. And if you start to look at your 
workflow, there are so many examples of repetitive tasks in that workflow. It just takes some really creative thinking to, to figure out where best to deploy. As a workflow person, I want to say, if your workflow processes are not optimized, it is much harder to apply robotic process op automation of any oh, sort. Yeah. So when I'm thinking about how to roll this out, I would never start doing it where there were any sort of uh, bottlenecks in a process. So prior to RPA, I would go in and revisit each process and make sure that it's flowing as smooth as possible. And what happens, Joey, as you do that, you begin to find which tasks are repetitive that you can automate. Well, I just pulled up the Win Automation website and they have been acquired by Microsoft. Surprise, surprise. And now it's part of the Microsoft Power Automate platform. And if you guys on the listening to this, if you have Microsoft Office 365, you, you have an incredible mm -hmm. suite of tools at your disposal to build out some really incredible stuff. So yeah, that's fascinating to see. I hadn't realized that. Win automation, again, it, it's not that expensive and it, it's, it, you don't have to code. You can literally point and click your way to teaching that bot what it needs to do. It follows you. Yeah. That's right. Some other, I'll mention a couple others, RPA vendors that you might look into. Um, or bots, these are platforms. So basically you go, you get this software platform. It allows you to train a bot generally, right? And you buy your bots and licenses. And so when automation, I mentioned automation anywhere is another major player out there. UiPath is a big one. We, we actually use, do some stuff with what UiPath. And finally, there are some many open source options as well. And that's actually the path that we're going. If you want to build automation into your proprietary platform, you can actually go out. There's some open source RPA software out there that you're able to take that code and, and incorporate it into your own platform so that they're essentially your bots branded as your bots. Yeah. So any of those though, especially the when automation, anywhere UI path, those three have point and click, uh, programming, um, great support. And it's truly incredible the things you can do with them. Very cool. Well, I know we're about at time here, Joey. So uh, if anyone has any questions or wants to ask you more about AI or RPA or any of these topics, uh, how can they get in touch with you? Sure. Yeah, please reach out. My email, joeyg at prochant.com. Would love uh, to, to chat. This is one of my favorite topics, so I'm always open to talk about it. And we'll be sure to have you back because I know this stuff is constantly changing and we really just began to scratch the surface of, you know, what can be done here and reasons to to not fear the robot. And Rachel, you got any, uh, any closing thoughts since this is uh, a topic that's near and dear to you? I don't. I hope we get to keep talking about it. My favorite part of this is more of the softer side and helping everybody come to understand things a little bit better. But I'm looking forward to continuing conversations on this topic. All right. Awesome. Again, thank you, Joey, for joining us today. And thank you, everyone, for listening. If you have any questions about the show or you have a guest that you think would be a good fit for our topics, uh, please email me at Chuck Ellis, C-H-U-C-K-E-L-L-I-S, at Prochant. Dot com and be sure to subscribe if you're on youtube and if you leave us a rating on apple podcasts that will really help us spread the word about the show so again thank you so much for listening we'll see you next time take care thank you thanks for listening to the modern healthcare back office a presentation of prochant a wholly owned revenue cycle management service dedicated to serving hme pharmacy infusion and other healthcare providers learn more about us at prochant.com